Be sure to mute, Gerard. Welcome to the Academy of Distinguished Teaching Scholars Shared Experience Forum about effective online teaching tips that actually work. I'm Tom Cannon, professor in practice in the marketing department in the Carlos Alvarez College of Business, and I'll be serving as your moderator today for the forum. The forum is hosted by the UTSA's Academy of Distinguished Teaching Scholars. The Academy was established by the provost in 2012 to honor outstanding faculty who exemplify excellence in teaching. Each Academy member is also a recipient of the UT Systems Regents Outstanding Teaching Award. Part of the Academy's charge is to host opportunities like today's forum to share tips on teaching excellence. Now the forums wouldn't be possible without the partnership of the Office of Academic Affairs and their professional teams and their Academic Innovation Support Division and their Academic Strategic Communications. Our thanks to Provost Epsi and her team. Now, for those of you who have never joined us before, our forum is divided into two equal parts. The first 30 minutes allows each panelist to briefly share the thoughts on their forum topic. And then the last 30 minutes is reserved for questions from you. During the forum, please take the time while you're thinking about it to type your brief questions into the chat room and we will attempt to get to each question during the Q&A. Now, rather than bringing in outside consultants, the Academy believes we should first consult with our own experts the UTSA faculty and have them share their experiences. Joining us today as panelists are Amy Jones, Assistant Professor of Practice in Integrative Biology, Luca Pazzi, Assistant Professor in Anthropology, Rita Mitra, Associate Professor of Practice in Information Systems and Cybersecurity, and Erica Wallace in public health. Each panelist will share their tips about one specific topic, a tactic that they have used in their online courses. The tactics we will discuss today are how to design your course to improve overall efficiencies, how to effectively incorporate group work, how you can integrate flexibility into your online course, and what tools work best to communicate with students. Now remember, after all panelists have completed their short presentations, we'll begin to address your questions. So please jot them down in the chat room so that we can answer them later. So let's get started. Panelists, as a reminder, it would be helpful if you could begin your topic by talking about the enrollment size that you have for the course or courses in which you've used some of these tactics. Amy, let's get started with you. No matter the enrollment size, we are all looking for ideas to help improve our course efficiency. What's worked for you? Um, so let me get my screen shared. All right, and then this one here, share it. Okay, and then slideshow from beginning. Okay, so Amy Jones, that's me. I teach in integrative biology. Um, I had, when I was online for the pandemic, we're talking about. Time. All righty. Um, and so, can you guys see my PowerPoint okay? That I 
put on them in order to make my class a better class. Um, one of them was peer feedback. I also put my rubric grading system on the assignment, my learning outcomes. I enrolled a system of do it again stamp. And then I used my Excel spreadsheets to do my grading and to send to my students. Um, so peer feedback, the way I use that is before the semester began, I create the group for them. And you can create these groups anywhere from four to eight peers per group, just kind of depending on your needs. Um, in my sections, they would stay in the same peer group all semester, and they would only exchange with one peer per assignment. So they're not getting feedback for each assignment from eight different people, because that would be really overwhelming. It's just one peer in their group for each assignment and then they rotate with the other peers throughout the semester all right um, peer feedback what does it do obviously it can improve their grade it gives them a chance for revision before they turn it into you obviously that benefits them because it can improve their grade it also benefits you and your grading because there will be corrections made before you get to it um, it exposed them to how their peers answer or think about questions. It gives them what I call aha moments um, with each assignment or without the semester, throughout the semester. And we do about 10 assignments a semester. Um, I hope that they get two or three aha moments through the peer feedback. And what that is, is a lot of times you'll read your peers answers and they'll be pretty similar but every now and then your peer will expose you to something you hadn't considered and you go oh my gosh i haven't even considered that and that's a powerful for me and that's a powerful learning tool for our students um, of course it teaches them how to give feedback and of course they develop that skill as the semester progresses and then it teaches them how to receive feedback as well so peer feedback i find is is incredibly important and it's something that's easy to roll out in online courses. Rubrics um, for students, they do two things. The first thing that creating a grading rubric does is it clearly defines on the assignment what it takes to earn full credit for each question. All right. So some of our students know right off the bat what it looks like to give a complete answer on an assignment but some students don't know exactly what that level is that we're looking for and if you define it in a rubric you can help them achieve it also when they lose points then they can go back and reference the rubric and see oh you know i didn't use scientific i teach uh, molecular genetics so i didn't use scientific terminology so that's why i lost some points on that question they can begin to piece it together themselves. Um, for you, creating a rubric helps you better define your grading process and it allows you to have more consistent grading. Um, and when I was going about making my rubrics, I really didn't realize how it was going to benefit me. But then once I laid it out in terms, it made my grading go faster. And I know that my grading became more consistent with it because I had a, a, a defined idea for it. Learning outcomes. These are what your students are going to learn through your course. Um, what students will be able to do once they take your course. And then what are your goals for your students? Um, and then the student benefits of the learning outcomes. They have less of why am I doing this? Um, if you can relate every question on an assignment back to one of your set learning outcomes, then they can understand better why they're learning something. Um, from the first day of class, they begin to understand your plan for them and it gives them more purposeful learning, okay? Your benefits of creating learning outcomes for your class helps you determine if the questions on assignments, quizzes, exams are necessary, and then it can help guide you to what is truly meaningful to what is maybe filler. Um, so once you establish your learning outcomes, then you can go through an assignment and look at a question and say, how does this achieve my learning outcomes? Um, and a lot, a lot of times you'll find it does, and sometimes you'll find, well, it doesn't reach my learning outcomes and I can get rid of this question, okay? Um, I use do it again stamps online. I use stamps and quotes in person. I have actual stamps for it. Um, for quizzes, assignments, and exams, if the student sees the stamp on a question, 
then they have the opportunity to do it again so that they can recover the full points that they missed. Um, what I have learned is I have to have them do it the same week that I return the assignment to them. Typically during office hours is when they'll come by and do it again with me. Um, if you don't make the caveat where you've got to do it the same week the assignment is returned, at the end of the semester, you're going to have all of your students with all of their assignments trying to recoup those points. And that's just nuts, okay? Um, since they're learning, I like to create a space um, where they can continue the process of learning. Since we're trying to create lifelong learners, I like to give them the opportunity to do things again when they need that reinforcement. Okay, Excel. I found when I was doing my online courses that Excel streamlined my grading process with the online courses, and then I'd email each student um, an Excel spreadsheet. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So this is, and you can see this assignment, okay? Is that right? Thumbs up? Okay. All right, so um, I do a record of their work. I like to know how long it takes them to do my assignments. Um, I try to be very aware of their time because I know they're as busy as I am. And so here they are, my learning outcomes that I established with them at the start of the semester. Here is my grading rubric with what it takes to get the full points, what happens, um, what you're giving me if you don't get the full points. And then on the assignment, um, I have it numbered here for the learning outcome that it corresponds to, and then I prompt where they give feedback. And I don't ask for feedback on every question. I only ask for feedback on some of those more harder thinking questions, and then I give them a space for their revisions, all right? Um, so that's what my assignments look like, and I do different sections, of course. I do review my material from previous sections and all of that. My Excel spreadsheet looks like this. All right, I'll have the assignment name and then the questions are numbered and then I give them their score and it's auto summed down here. And then I will in the comments, let them know when they do something really, really well. And then if there's something that I want them to revisit, then on my Excel spreadsheets, I'll stamp it in a certain color and that's something that they can revisit. And then this is something that I email to them. And typically what I do um, is I have a Surface Pro so I can split screen. I can have their assignment on half of my screen and my Excel sheet on the other half, and it streamlined my process for me. It made things move really quickly. All righty. Um, so I hope you'll have some questions for me in the last 30 minutes. Let uh, me Amy, start. <laughs> Amy, I, I appreciate that. Let me just ask uh, uh, the panelists, were you able to see the Excel spreadsheet? Okay, what, what we'll do is during the Q&A, is have you go back and briefly show the Excel spreadsheet? It didn't come. It didn't come up. We saw your slides, but we didn't see the Excel spreadsheet. Okay. But I don't want to miss out on that because I put that down as a question for myself. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks so much, um, Luca. You know, oh. we all we all understand the value of students learning how to work with a team because we tell them. They're going to have to work with teams when they go into the workplace. But we also know the challenges of the frequent student complaints that working within a group. So what tips can you share with us about incorporating group work into our pedagogy? Uh, okay, um, hope you can uh, you can see my screen. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for inviting me and talking about, about this topic that I've been working on for, for a while. Um, so um, some of the tips that I'm going to give today, some work, some don't necessarily work that well, it depends on the context, but they can easily be applied to online setting, but also face-to-face -face or hybrid. There's a lot of flexibility in, in that sense. So I think one of the first thing that we need to start asking ourselves is like, should we actually even include uh, group work in our, in our class? I think, you know, we all value the idea of people working in groups. And as, you know, uh, Tom said about, you know, collaboration, uh, but sometimes, you know, group work can become a nightmare for the students and for ourselves. And so I think it's really important to stop for a second and just ask ourselves, should we actually include that? And in which classes we can actually benefit? So it's actually a basic question of why. 
And so I think it's something to consider are really what are our learning outcomes. Uh, we all want students to work together and collaborate, but there are so many different ways that you can do that. It doesn't have to be necessarily a full semester project in order for them to exchange ideas or to collaborate on something together. And if it's the ob objective is only just for them to talk to each other and work together in some ways, uh, there might be other way to actually, actually do it. We need to consider class size because it's true that group work is often used as a way to reduce also the amount of grading that we do. So instead of you know grading 150 students, we only grade a few groups, but can also be uh, extremely demanding if grading is not done uh, accordingly. And also related to class size, we know also to consider the group size because we don't want to have groups that are too big, uh, depending on, of course, the project that, you, that you're you doing. My own experience, I never go between more than three or four uh, students uh, per group. And finally, as I mentioned, we really need to evaluate the length and the way that this group work is going to have in our class. So how long is going to last? Is it going to be uh, just a one day activity, two days activity, a one week activity, or it's going to be a long a semester long uh, project? And also how much of the grade uh, is going gonna, is gonna to be. So as you know, we know there are a lot of struggles in group works and probably all of us are pretty well aware of them. Uh, students complain a lot. Uh, and we know that no matter what you do, they're going to complain that they don't want a working group, that they feel that their grade is affected by it, et cetera. I mean, this is related to a lack of accountability in the sense the student don't necessarily do their fair share. So students come to the class with different interests, with different goals, and some of them are putting a lot of effort in doing that. They want to micromanage the group, and some are just like, you know, free riders. They hope that, you know, they're going to get the full grade. Uh, by not doing uh, much or try to do them as, as little as possible. Um, engagement is a big issue for groups because sometimes if students are not engaged in the topic in general, they might even not perform that well in individual assignment. That's even worse in group project because they can think about, well, other people can do it because I'm not really interested in what I'm trying to, uh, to achieve here. So students, in other words, don't care. And finally, uh, lack of communication is probably one of the most uh, important aspects. It says the students don't want or can't communicate uh, with each other. And so miscommunication, lack of communication create a lot of issues in, in this sense in group projects, especially actually online. Uh, here are some possible solutions and tips that I've been using uh, recently. First of all, it seems like kind of silly in a way, but share the purpose. Explain explicitly why you're doing the group work. Why is it important that the group work is part of the plan, is part of the class? Why is he uh, fulfilling some of the learning outcomes of your class? And how can he actually help them in other settings? Because when students understand what they're doing and why they're doing, they actually respond very well to it. I spend a lot of time creating group contracts. Students work for over a month, usually working on a group contract. That's basically their first assignment in which they not only they make themselves accountable and they understand what are their responsibilities, but they also prepare them to work in teams. You know, this is like, you know, if you want to teach someone how to drive, you don't just give them a car and just say, hey, go. And then by the end of the semester, you know, come back to me. That's not how it works, right? You want to tell them how to drive. And so you want to tell them how to work in groups. I think group choice is critical. And this is really depends on what kind of group project you have. But create a variety of projects that can actually trigger their attention so that a student can actually pick whatever uh, project they actually uh, want or they feel, you know, engaged with. Um, I also create a balance between individual and group deliverables. Uh, so in that sense, not everything is graded for the full group, but a lot of chunks, in my case, is even like 50% or more, is graded individually. And so this kind of helps mitigate some of those complaints for students that don't feel like they're doing their fair share and, and so on. And student roles are important. I think the why we work in group, even as a, you know, as a team in our own work, is because we have different skills, different expertise. So let students do what they do best. So if there has a creative person, let that creative person work with someone that is a good writer. Let that person work with someone that is a good speaker. 
if your goal at the end of the of the semester is to have a presentation where like four people are presenting their chunks of their project uh, all together, that's going to be a recipe for failure, very likely. Let one of them to present, the one that is actually the best speaker in, in, in the group. And I think in online in particular, share technology for effective collaboration, give them options, but also let them choose their options. If you force them to, oh, you only can communicate in Blackboard um, uh, discussion board, that's not going to work. Uh, so if they can pick their own uh, means of communication, it works much better for them. Just be clear that this is actually very well explained in, uh, in the group contract. And finally, if you have class time, like hybrid classes, or you have synchronous sessions, or even an optional session, just have some time dedicated to that, to group work, because allow them to meet to each other, to connect, and dedicate a certain time to the group project over the course of the semester. I'm just going to give you like what I call a success story question mark because you never know. But this is a, a, book, a book club that I do in my evolution of sex class. Um, it's a, a, a book club that runs for the entire semester. Students have to pick a book of their choice among a big selection. So that's part of the engagement component. And then is a set of mini milestones that they go incrementally over the course of the semester. So we start with very small assignment to the big, large final project. So students are working with the same people for the entire semester. They also share their work with the rest of the class and they review other people's work. So there's a lot of peer learning happening there. And so they are accountable not only to me and to other members of the group, but to the rest of the class. And finally, um, I allow them to have individual reflection about what that group work means to them, how it's connected to the class and to their everyday life. And that's where I actually get the best uh, responses. So I want to conclude with a problem that I haven't solved yet. Students complain a lot. There's still something that happens. It's definitely less than it used to be, uh, but that's definitely one of the major criticisms that I still get in my evaluation is that, oh, I don't like the group work, you should quit. And I will never do it probably. Disappearing students is also a big issue. Students that just suddenly disappear, they're not part of the, pro, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the semester, of uh, the, the group anymore. So the, the size of the group changes over time. Um, and then sometimes they reappear. So that's something that is still very difficult to deal. And of course, we've seen that mainly online with students that are difficult to, to reach out. Uh, balancing the grading load is important as well. We know that, you know, we all think, oh, we have like a lot of students, I can just reduce the number of assignments that I have. But if you have that individual deliverables that I was talking about, just be sure that, you know, there is a good balance between that. Otherwise, you're going to drop a lot of grading. And finally, again, student communication, um, I definitely say that it's improved, but we expect this generation to be ready to communicate and, you know, master all the chats and, and you know, messaging apps, and they don't. Um, I think the virtual setting helps a lot, so they don't have to meet on campus. They can create this kind of platform, but it's important that there are clear rules of engagement in the group contact to improve our communication. And that's my spot, and I'm happy to question after the end of this session. Thank you, Luca. I definitely have jotted down some follow-up questions for you myself. Um, it was, this was a good tie-in, students disappearing. Uh, Rita, uh, most of us work with students who are missing class due to uh, recently, obviously the past two years, COVID-related illnesses, maybe a death in the family, um, and now mental health issues or other challenges that they're facing. So what tips can you share on how we can integrate maybe a little bit more flexibility into our courses that can respond to these um, expanding and changing student issues. Thanks, Tom, and hello, everyone. Um, so just to answer Tom's question, I teach a few courses, and um, one of them has 150 to 200 students every semester. Another one has about 60. And then this semester, I have a more of an independent study uh, course that's about 13 students. So it runs the gamut. They're all online. So um, so I'm focusing on flexibility. What does flexibility really mean in teaching? Um, I'd like to propose that flexibility does not mean loosey-goosey or unstructured teaching. 
In fact, flexibility takes just as much planning as any other instructional approach. And flexibility is also not the opposite of accountability. Um, a course can be flexible and still set high expectations for students. So the main purpose of flexibility in my mind, uh, to speak to Tom's point, is to increase student success across the board through an inclusive environment. Um, that is one that takes into account a student's background experiences and if needed, their current circumstances. Of course, this, this sounds like an idyllic um, approach, but in practice, it's very challenging, particularly in a large online and uh, asynchronous course. However, offering flexibility in a course can be accomplished through minor adjustments and over time, such that the course can appear to be customized for students. And that appearance in and of itself uh, can increase student engagement and demonstrate instructor presence uh, seemingly real time in the course. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of ideas here. They, they really align with what Amy and Luca have already discussed. Um, so the first involves course policies, such as due dates and grading, and the second is around the assignments themselves in terms of content and modality. So for the first, uh, we all typically outline our course policies in our syllabus, including a schedule of assignments and due dates, penalties for late assignments, how to make up assignments if allowed, et cetera. And an online course is typically very structured uh, with assignments due each week at the same time to make sure students are um, engaging in the course periodically. But we could potentially tweak uh, by offering what I call second chances for students, um, much like Amy has already discussed. So first, you might allow late submissions if the student notifies you uh, by the day before the deadline, for example, gives the reason for the extension request and provides a new action plan themselves. And this also highlights the fact that communication is an essential component in an online environment and that both instructors and students are responsible for keeping this dialogue going. On the other hand, to be fair to students who turn in their assignments promptly, uh, you could offer an extra point or points for those who submit their assignments one or more days ahead of time. Many students take uh, take me up on this option. Uh, this offers the additional benefit of spreading out my grading timeline and providing more feedback to those early submitters who often look for and uh, read comments carefully. Also importantly, those who work on assignments early frequently highlight issues in the assignment itself or common issues that uh, rise later with other students. So in turn, we can communicate tips or clarification back to the other students real time on Slack or in announcements and thank those early submitters who provided the impetus for the tips. Second chances can also involve the opportunity to submit a revision on a first assignment. While students are coming up to speed on how the course works, or even on subsequent assignments, if the students demonstrated substantial efforts, but simply ran into an issue. I also tried something new this semester by asking students to turn in what they have by the due date, even if it's not complete, uh, kind of alluding to the disappearing uh, student that Luca mentioned. The thought is that just the act of getting started and turning something in might be half the battle. Uh, also, sometimes students ask for an extension by stating that they've been working really hard on an assignment and just have hit a roadblock. And so asking them to post what they've already done promotes some transparency. This has had some good results. Several students did turn in work where they wouldn't have otherwise, which is great. Uh, it also highlighted the actual point at which students were asking for an extension, which prompted some good dialogue. However, quite a few students have not returned to uh, complete their partial turn-ins as of yet. So the jury's out on this experiment so far. 
Uh, and then quickly on my other issue regarding the content of individual assignments. This addresses the circumstance in which students in a course come from diverse backgrounds, say from fields other than the home department's major, or even majors coming in with various levels of preparedness or with varying technologies at their disposal. So in this case, it's really helpful to build up a library of alternative assignments for students who are in the process of obtaining the proper resources or technology or students who would benefit from completing an assignment that's more relevant to their degree. One key to making this work is to have the same or very similar rubric for all the variations of one assignment. In other words, students can follow a template for the assignment such that a general rubric works across the board for that assignment. Um, and then one final uh, element of flexible teaching, uh, which Luca addressed also, uh, and I think many of us employ, is to offer students multiple modes of submission for at least one assignment, a video, a podcast. Sometimes I offer or even require students to demo or present their assignment live over a Zoom session. This is helpful to verify their work or to help them with outstanding issues on one hand. And then on the other end of the spectrum, to offer ways in which an advanced student can take the assignment further on their own. So these are just some thoughts. I'm sure our other panelists have many others floating out there as well as comments on YouTube. So I look forward to that. Pass the baton back to you, Tom. Thanks, Rita. And I've definitely jotted down a lot of notes and I'm sure the chat room is gonna be filling up too. Um, part of the challenge that I'm seeing is where do you all find the time for this? this we can discuss that in a minute. Uh, Erica, um, we've talked about the need to stay in touch with our students during the semester. And But what's worked for you other than just using the Blackboard course messages that a lot of us use? How do you communicate with students during the semester? Thanks, Tom. So I started teaching online spring 2020 pre COVID. Um, and that was actually a huge blessing because as my other courses went online, I was better prepared slightly to deal with those issues. Um, and so y'all can see here that I have a 4-4 course load. And so this is for my other FTTs that are out there. And how do you communicate with literally hundreds of students across sometimes different disciplines or very different class um, topic areas? I teach everything from intro to public health courses all the way up to, uh, you know, 4,000 level courses. Um, and so I'm going to briefly go over one challenging area and then several wins that I hope you can apply in your classrooms as well. I wanted to start with a major challenge area for me, and that is the use of group discussions, especially via Blackboard. They are really considered a gold standard for student engagement, and I have found that they do not work well because I do not have the time in my class sizes to adequately respond to students. Like Luca outlined, there are a lot of complaints when it comes to some work, especially in the semesters where I've tried different modalities of group discussions, um, including small groups, large groups. I've tried weekly discussions for online summer courses to keep students engaged. I've tried just summary discussions at the end of modules. Um, and my final verdict on this is that they're not for me and my classes at this time. I know that there are some great opportunities for uh, discussion, especially in live classes. Um, but if you're in class sizes like mine, there are different ways to get folks involved. So now I'd love to share a few wins that I've experienced. Um, and the first one is kind of controversial. Most of my colleagues in my department would never in a million years do this, but I have found it works really well for me. During the pandemic, um, that first semester, I found out that I could develop a free Google Voice number. Um, this is a phone number that is connected to my um, Gmail account information. I am a, a big Google user and my students can text me, they can call, they can leave voicemail, it pre-screens my calls for me and it keeps my email inbox freer. So I utilize this option by um, allowing students to text me from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. You could set your own hours, but those are the hours that work for my work-life balance. 
Um, and it's helpful for students because they can get almost immediate feedback instead of waiting 24 to 48 hours via email. And so y'all can see an example here that came in um, just last week where a student wanted a quick clarification about a group assignment. Um, and you might not be able to see the time, but they sent the question at 6.28 p.m. I was able to respond by 6.29 p.m. ensuring that they could get um, that question answered and their assignment completed on time. I also didn't have to trudge through a lot of emails, you know, the next day because I was able to give those quick responses. Um, and this is free. I don't have to pay anything for this. And this is the number I've actually started using for all of my work communication um, since our department has gone away from having traditional landlines uh, in the more virtual environment. I do want to note that, of course, any questions that come through text about a specific grade, I do have students, um, I, I encourage them to contact me through their student email account or set up a time to discuss that by phone. Um, another great way to connect with our students, especially in these large online asynchronous courses, is to make them feel good. And I think there's a lot of value in connecting with our students and encouraging them. So one of the techniques that I've used um, is creating email blasts. Most of my courses will typically have three to four exams during the semester. After exam one, I have them um, run an analysis on how they performed, how they had studied and prepared. After exam two, I then go back, I batch everyone by the letter grade they received on that exam. And I have pre-written messages that I just send um, to the students, line copied uh, to everybody that made an A, everyone that made a B, and they all have, um, each of those letter grades receives a different message. And so you can see my B grade example here. Um, I have had so much good feedback from students, especially my students who didn't perform as well. They um, appreciate that I noticed. They usually respond back with, you know, I'm so sorry. They, they show accountability. They also talk about what they're going to do the next go round um, for exam three and any subsequent exams. And I make sure that I avoid any shameful language, especially for students who don't perform well on the exams. I also provide links to resources, study skills, the success centers um, at UTSA. And so it's a really easy and great opportunity. Um, and it's very little effort on our part. Once you have your general messages created for each of those letter grades, all it takes is some um, tweaking each semester, I do have students sometimes that are in multiple classes with me every semester. So I have like a, a set for one class and a set for the other class. So it's not exactly the same. But even though um, it's not specialized to each student, the students really respond well. Um, and then my last one that I want to mention is that we all struggle when we have um, students in classes. And so this is um, most relevant to synchronous courses, whether they're online or in person. But a lot of times students don't want to ask questions. They don't want to ask the dumb question. Um, they don't want to own up to maybe they weren't paying attention to during the lecture. And so I use um, a tool called Minty or Mentimeter. And um, typically I'll have uh, three questions for every class period. Sometimes it's just a general check-in, but I always try and include a slide to go to halfway through the lecture or towards the end of the class. Um, and this is a screenshot from the second week of class for my environmental health and safety course this semester. And so I can ask them, you know, what's confusing, what needs to be revisited, what do you need more clarification on? And they can give me those questions in real time anonymously, and I can go through and answer them. And so this has been really helpful to me. Um, Mentimeter does give you three free questions um, to ask. You do have to pay for a service fee after that, but I've, I've found the three to be exactly what I needed. Um, and then the last thing I just want to go over is a few quick points on things that are best practices that we all should be doing, but maybe we don't think about, or maybe we don't place as much value as we could on them. Um, and so over communication is not a bad thing. I found this with students, especially with um, issues related to COVID and online instruction. Students tend to feel overwhelmed. That leads to confusion, a lack of focus, a lack of the ability to prioritize. And so I send out Monday announcements, Friday reminders, I send out day of reminders about when exams are due, and I have never had a student tell me on evaluations that I sent out too many reminders. It's always positive feedback that they appreciate the multiple reminders. 
I also use visual cues in my online courses. So for example, in weekly modules on Blackboard, anything that receives a grade um, is going to be color coded red. So it is quite easy for them to see and prioritize what they need to do that week. Um, and also just sending information through multiple channels. I do use Blackboard quite a bit. Um, I will also post uh, or, or discuss in class if I'm in, in person, but even for my in-person classes, I still utilize Blackboard quite heavily. Um, and I always want my students to have very clear understanding on assignments. And so communicating my expectations, like many of y'all have said, I heavily utilize rubrics. I've also found it really valuable to show students examples of work, including good work and bad work, um, so that it is clear to them uh, through written communication, through visuals, what they should focus on. And we could talk about a lot of different communication strategies, but these are just a few that have worked for me. Um, and so I'm gonna pause so that my colleagues can answer any questions that have come up. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Erica. Um, good stuff. Um, lots of things that I'm familiar with, some I use, and others I've been taking notes on that I could possibly use. We have some time now for the Q&A, and I want to go back to uh, Amy, and I don't know whether or not you have your Excel spreadsheet up by itself that we could go ahead and make visible. And if you could just spend about three minutes just going over it again, I think that would be helpful. And then I have some questions uh, that um, we can throw out to the other panelists also, or any of the panelists can certainly chime in. Okay, how about now? Are you able to see my Excel spreadsheet now? Perfect, okay. So when I was in my online class, I would of course email them their assignments and then they would send them back to me. And trying to grade and format and make comments um, on those assignments is very time consuming and quite frankly, a pain in the butt. Um, so what I came up with is I would do it in an Excel spreadsheet um, and I would list their questions here. And I, um, again, I teach molecular genetics. And so when we were online, we would do a fake results. So we'd show them pictures and they'd interpret it. And then I'd have always a review, which is several questions from the previous material. Um, and then I have my columns here with the score in it. And at the bottom, it's auto summed for me. So it calculates their grade for me. And then what I do is I comment on those questions that need comments. Um, I am very pro positive feedback like Erica is. So when they do something beautifully, I like to point it out to them. Just like when I do something beautifully, I like someone to tell me that. So my students are the same, right? Um, and then when there's something that needs more work, this is my stamp that I called it. Um, I would highlight it and then um, I would either guide them. So you can see here it says, I know that you said cells in a colony are different. If binary fission creates cells in ecology, would you revise your answer? So I tried to guide them to the correct answer without just telling them this is wrong, this is the right answer. Like I want to get them thinking about it to help them achieve it. Um, and then again, the highlight would be part of the stamp. All right, so then what I do is I save it and then I email it to my students. Um, and then I open up the same one, so I don't have on my desktop or anything 120 of these. I'll open up the same one and then do it for the next student and then save it. And so that way I just have one on my desktop and I keep sending it out to my students. Um, it streamlined my grading for me. I found, and like I said, I have a Surface Pro, so I can do a half screen. I can put their assignment on half the screen and then this Excel spreadsheet on the other half. I can scroll their assignment and then type in their score and my comments as I go. And it made it much quicker than anything else I had tried. All right, did that help? Very helpful. I okay. would actually say that was beautiful. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, I appreciate you. So let me stop sharing my screen and then I will meet myself. Um, Luca, I wanted to, a question came up. Um, that um, about your group contracts. Are these, um, do you have a template for that that you might change for uh, each semester, whatever? Is, is, it a, is it a lengthy process? Do you send it out by email and have the students sign and turn it back? How do you manage that? 
Uh, yeah, it's a template. The template can change depending on the kind of nature of the group work. The first time that I've done it, uh, my template was not good enough. And so I definitely didn't have good uh, results from that. That's, you know, uh, test trial and, and error. Um, so it's a pretty detailed uh, template that allows them to go through every single component of of the, the group project. So what are the expectations, what they're hoping to learn, how they want to communicate, what are the roles in the group, who's gonna be the leader, their emails, uh, what, how they're gonna communicate, what kind of channel are they gonna communicate, uh, and then really set the expectation and the rules of engagement in terms of like, how often are you gonna communicate? What are you gonna do if someone doesn't respond? How many reminders are you gonna send? How long are you gonna wait until? And this is actually helps them not really just to have expectation. I think students very often don't have expectation. You have you know, two people in a group and one wants a text message immediately and freaks out if he doesn't. And the other person's like, oh, if I reply in a week, it's totally fine. And so those two personalities, of course, are gonna conflict against each other. But if they've decided that you know, 48 hours, is the rule, then they know. And you know, and, and then also when to escalate it. So how they're gonna like start communicating to their, you know, myself and I, how am I gonna like react on them. So I, I think that works in that way. And that's assignment for the first few weeks. Um, so what I also do, I give extensive feedback. So I allow them to work on the group and the template and sign it and everything. And then I give them feedback and I give them a grade. And then I get it back, I provide extensive feedback. If it's work and it's fine, it's great. I can say, okay, you have a hundred, you're wonderful. Otherwise I tell them, well, well, you have another extra week or so to fix those issues and give it back and I will regret it. And so my goal for the group content is that every group is gonna get a hundred percent. I don't care about, because the group contact has to be good. It doesn't, it's not for me a test. So that's the way that I, I'm, I've been working on that. And yeah, they have to sign it. That's great. Obviously a, a lot of work on your part. In fact, I'm sitting here listening to a lot of this. Rita, did you want to make a comment about this? Okay, but I do have a question for you, Rita. Um, this is kind of related. Um, the, you talked about second chances. And the question is, uh, this came out, uh, I think, about, about late submissions. Is that, um, and Luca, you're allowing your teams to do revisions and revisions. Um, so Rita, why don't you take a shot at this? If we're trying to prepare students to go into the real world, if you're working for a business and you have deadlines, those deadlines have to be met because there's accountability and I like the fact that Luca and many of you have accountability, the contract is an example. But why do we give second chances? Um, I'll just speak from personal experience. I have students, uh, not in the College of Business, who are used to this in the social sciences. They would say, hey, Dr. Cannon, I, uh, I know I'm late, uh, but I'll go ahead and take the points deducted. And I say, well, the points deducted, you don't have a chance to repeat this. There was a deadline and you've known about this. So why is it important to give second chances? That is a very valid point. Um, so coming from a software development background, uh, we live in a world of revisions anyway. Nothing is ever perfect. We're always in a revision cycle um, and we're always versioning. So uh, to me, offering the ability to, to revise your work because nothing is ever perfect, is a, a valuable concept to promote to students in and of itself. Um, and then the other aspect of having to meet deadlines at work, I think in my experience, yes, there are deadlines, there are hard deadlines, but communication often makes those deadlines softer. So sometimes you simply cannot get out a product. It's just not going to make that deadline. But communicating along the way, how much have I done? What are the pressure points? Um, what is not working? That is also a valuable skill 
to uh, provide to students to let them know, as I mentioned uh, before, that communication covers a lot of sins um, and it's, it's a valuable skill in itself when, when you are encountering difficulties. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah, I, oh, go ahead, Amy. Sorry. Um, so for me, second chances, we're talking about two things. The first thing we're talking about is second chances to revise material that you didn't get right. For me, that's important because they're learning. And I teach molecular genetics. There are some topics that even in my brilliant way of explaining things, they need to sit down and do it again. Right. Um, and then as far as deadlines go, um, I allow my students one whoops a semester is what I call it. Everyone's allowed a whoops. We're human beings. We get busy. We drop the ball occasionally, that kind of thing. So they get one whoops for any of their assignments. They don't even have to give me an excuse. They just say I need 48 more hours and they get that free and clear. And then after that, that's when I'll start to deduct points for their other assignments. And while yes, I do have deadlines like being prepared for this talk today was a deadline and I was prepared for it. There are lots of times when we have softer deadlines or lots of times when we can go to our chair and say, look, I'm completely overwhelmed. I have this list of things to do. I need a little more time figuring this out. And they give that to us. I've been given second chances. And I think that building that into our class is important. Uh, Luca, you wouldn't comment? Yeah, no, I mean, a lot of the points are being covered. You know, I think uh, one is reality. Yes, there are deadlines, but a lot of deadlines are flexible. I mean, how many times I send out emails, I, I can have an extinction myself. So I think we also need to just differentiate between hard deadline and soft deadline, I think is important. As I said, it's a learning process, as people who are free that Amy mentioned. I think students are learning how to what deadlines are important, and then they might lose points in a way. And, you know, in the process of like redoing things is a, is a chance to learn. And I think also something that hasn't been covered is empathy. A lot of students are going through a lot uh, in their lives with their families, with their jobs, and particularly during the last two years and during the, um, during the um, uh, you know, the pandemic and their online settings. And I think it's important that if the external world doesn't give you enough empathy, because it doesn't, I think at least we can do it in our classes and still maintaining a learning environment. And I'd like to just add to that, you know, Tom, I take a little bit more of an approach like you, if, if they're applying for a help grant, like grants have hard deadlines that, you know, there's not really any flexibility here. So what I do in my courses instead is I have hard deadlines for things like quizzes and exams. If you don't take it when you're supposed to, that's on you. But I agree with Luca. I think empathy is really important, especially if we want this to be a thriving institute for first gen and non-traditional students we have to have that room and so i have a, a course policy you know one bad day shouldn't ruin your entire grade for the course and so i build in um, extra credit and i list the extra credit explicitly on the syllabus so that students will know that they have opportunities to prove their mastery of concepts in different ways to give them a little bit more confidence when they have those screw up or, or the whoops like amy said um, and i think it is important to build that in um, while we still maintain some of those standards. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that. And, and Rita hit so many of them with the flexibility. One of the comments in uh, chat, uh, so, um, I share with you, Erica, says uh, definitely I use the phone number thing myself, except I do it by forwarding my office phone to my cell. Obviously, texts aren't possible using this strategy. Google does seem like a better idea. Um, I, I do the very same thing that, that this person does, is that for years, and faculty would always say, why are you forwarding your office phone to your cell phone? I said, well, you know, students need to get a hold of me. I mean, that's a great way to do that. And you're correct. Not all faculty are thinking that way. Um, just a couple of comments that I have. I, I like the fact that all of you made some comments that this didn't work for you. Um, uh, specifically, Erica, I don't use discussion boards. I do that as a way for them to introduce themselves. Uh, and it's amazing. One, I, there is some give and take. Somebody says, I'm ex-military or I'm a mom of three kids, it's gone back to school. And I can see the communication, but they'd rather be in group me and then talking. 
as opposed to doing anything. Um, I always love it when they send an invite to me for the group name, but uh, of course I don't join. Uh, so I like the fact that um, some of you have found that discussion boards just don't work. Also like Rita, the fact that you said you can be flexible, but still set high expectations. And that's what I think you're all trying to do. We want our students to be successful. We want to nudge them. And sometimes you got to really push them to succeed. But some of you may be getting the same comments that I am. Uh, hey, Dr. Cannon, I'm sorry I missed the uh, first four quizzes out of the uh, 12 and I'm failing the class, but uh, you know, uh, could I go back and make those up? And that's a week ago and the semester is almost over. And I send out weekly announcements twice, I e-blast, I do all these things. So at some point, the reason I'm, I'm asking these questions, as faculty members, we, I feel that we're also, we're sensitive. And I ask for documentation, students appreciate that. You know, if it's, if they go to a funeral, send the obituary. I always am very sensitive and send things back or they're in the hospital. I've worked with students all the time on this, but you know when you're being gamed. And then um, you, you try to be sensitive to them. So it's a delicate balance, I agree. But I also feel that I'm an advocate for those students who are doing the work. And I have to be sensitive to those and make sure that, that they're not taking advantage of our good natures. Uh, any questions from the panelists or other panelists? Any ideas you, you'd like to share or questions you'd like to follow up on with other panelists? Can I chip in on what you just said, Tom? Uh, because I think uh, one of the strategies that I've been using is to provide what, what I usually call tokens in my class, opportunity in which they can skip whatever deadlines are their own choice, and that applies to everybody. Um, and so, you know, I want to skip that quiz, he's going to skip that quiz. And this applies to everybody. So if someone has a problem or not, and there's no question ask, asked. And the other thing, I always have one chance that I, I don't tell them specifically. But I always have one chance per student that is the benefit of the doubt. And they're telling me that something happened. I just decided to believe them for once. I don't ask documentation and I'll let them out. If that becomes a potter, that's it. But the tokens actually give them like ability to um, make it flexible for themselves a little bit. So it's an option. One of the things that uh, I, I want to piggyback on that, I always allow an optional a quiz at the end that will replace one of their lowest quizzes. So if a student misses it and they say, can I make it up? And they realize that was my, my error, I should have done this. I say, look, you still have the opportunity. Oh yeah, I completely forgot about that. Amy, you have So I know that there were asking about time. When do we have time to do this stuff on our assignments? Like when do you have time to make rubrics and learning outcomes and peer feedback and all that? You do one thing a semester. Right. If you're looking at us and what we do and we're telling you five things we do, you're like, oh, my gosh, how do I roll all that out? Don't roll out one thing. Um, you know, can you start with your next assignment? Can you put a rubric on it for you and your students? Start there. And so I didn't do peer feedback and rubrics and learning outcomes and my stamp to redo a question. That didn't all happen in one semester. It's things that I have been exposed to, or if I was inspired by watching someone else do something to do something in my class, and I try to make a change each semester, at least one change each semester. Some things work. Some things you're like, wow, this was great. And some things you're like, man, that was terrible. I'm not doing that again. Um, and that's just kind of how you have to grow in your classroom. So again, try not to be overwhelmed, be inspired, and try one thing. Try one thing new. That's all you have to do. Well, our time together has come to an end. Um, our thanks to uh, Amy Jones, Luca Pozzi, Rita Mitra, and Erica Wallace for sharing your all's experiences about effective online teaching. Now, not theoretical ideas, but actual tips that have worked for you. And I appreciate that. I know each panelist would welcome those of you who are watching to contact them for any follow-up discussion. So please reach out to them if needed. And, be aware that today's form is being recorded and it will be posted at the provost website. The Academy of Distinguished Teaching Scholars actually has a page there. So if in about an hour or so, the high definition of the video should be available. Please go into the search bar on utsa.edu and type in ADTS form 
and up will pop a link and click on that and then scroll down, you'll be able to see the most recent form. We also have the video recordings of all the other forms that the Academy has done. Our thanks again to the team of professionals in the Office of Academic Affairs who help make share experience forms possible every single semester. That's the Academic Innovation Support Division and the Academic Strategic Communications. And to each of you who have joined us today, and thanks on behalf of the UTSA Academy of Distinguished Scholars for making the time to uh, join us and to also contribute to the discussion. Now, please watch your emails for our next shared experience form during fall semester of 2022.